how how fast has things changed, right? And so the other day we were uh, we were thinking about doing this or that, and then and the, today, you know, what we were thinking about three or four weeks ago, I could care less about. And so I, I'm reminded um, to to watch for the signs. Uh, I am reminded of everything I heard as a, a child, and um, the reality is Jesus is coming back for his children. He is coming back for uh, his bride-to-be, and we're supposed to be waiting, right? Uh, the lamp is ready. Don't run out of oil. Uh, don't be concerned about the, the worries and things that distract you. Uh, be very, very concerned about what is happening right now in a good way. Be ready for the return. And um, it's in our backyard. Uh, talked to a lady, part of our church body, our family. And uh, she said, you know, we have someone that uh, has got the virus in our own backyard in the town of Alvin. And so I want you guys praying for that family, um, lifting them up, letting them know we have your back in prayer uh, because they are an extended family of our family. And so it's important to, uh, to be lifting them up in prayer. Um, this evening, I am reminded of something that I saw over the park in uh, Eldon one time. It said, it said, smile, you're on camera. And what it meant was you were probably doing something you wasn't supposed to be doing. Um, but in this case, you know the world is watching what the church is doing. It's watching. And the saddest thing is, uh, is that when you go by a church and it says, closed until further notice. The, the church will never and can never close. Uh, if, if pastors and leadership and church bodies, if they want to stay at home and they don't want to do anything, that's fine. He's going ra- to raise up a group of people that will. And so anywhere in the world where they've tried to stomp out or silence um, God's believers, he has raised forth a miraculous generation of believers that says we will hide out in our houses, uh, we will become creative. Uh, our pastor here has done a great job. We will park cars in the parking lot. Uh, we will wear the media team out, and uh, they will have to come up with new ways to, to figure out how to uh, transmit it, but we will have church. And the church doesn't have to be in the building. We will go forth uh, in the streets. And so uh, I'm encouraged tonight. I'm not I'm not worried, although worry comes on me, but I'm encouraged that God is still in control. And so the title of this message tonight is, um, Have You Felt the Heat? And what that means to me is, is when is the last time that the Holy Spirit has impressed on you to do something? And I'm going to give you an example uh, because that's not meant to be elusive. It's meant to be simple. I, I prayed a simple prayer yesterday. And, uh, this, you know, this is the kind of prayer growing up, uh, Lord, I'll do anything you want, but don't send me to Africa kind of thing, right? Like, it, it's awkward. Don't ask him to do something because he's going to ask you to do the one thing uh, that you don't want to do. And so uh, that's kind of fearful, I, and I don't think that that's how he works, but um, it was a real concern. So I prayed, I said, God, uh, put one person in my path today that needs to know about you, just one. Just one. And, and I say that to you not because my witness is bold, because uh, oftentimes I am very fearful to share what is within me, but I know that every time that I do that, faith grows inside of me. And so I went to the store. Uh, I thought I was going for um, a little deal to put floors down because mine broke, and I threw it in the air, and then I threw my hammer, and then I went in town, and I said, God, Show me somebody that needs to hear you. And I'm walking down the aisles, and lo and behold, uh, there is a, a young student that used to be a part of our youth group, and uh, and I and and he started telling me, and he just he just he just looked like things weren't going good, and so we had a discussion um, about how good God is, right? And it doesn't stop there. Then that afternoon, I come home. He he put four people in my path that day. Struck out on a couple. On two of them, I felt like I did a pretty good job but you know what no matter if you've struck out a hundred times up until now tomorrow or this evening start with that prayer lord put somebody in front of my path that needs to know who you are and that's what he will do why because the church cannot remain silent so if you feel the heat what that means to me is 
That is the Holy Spirit. That is that moment where your palms begin to sweat, where you begin to tremble because you don't know what to say. And that is when you have an opportunity to allow faith to push fear to the side and say, you know what? I'm fearful and I'm doubtful, but I'm going to take one step. Why? Because faith without action is it's worthless. And so that's my encouragement to you. And uh, and see if he doesn't show up in, a, in an opportunity after you pray that. Um, let me get to it here. So when you talk about heat, you think of fire. And uh, my child, three of my kids, they all go to the same school. And uh, I'll give a shout out to King's Academy uh, because they have been a blessing to my family. It's a church in Bagnell, uh, over in Bagnell Dam. And what they have done as a local church, <clears throat> you say, Matthew, well, you're talking about another church. Well, we're all part of the same body, right? And so what this church has figured out is to, to do it the most impactful way, you need more than a couple hours with the child during the week. Amen? And so what they have done is they have taken an opportunity to invest a lot of resource and a lot of time to make it affordable to a lot of, of, of families that could never pray, uh, pay for private school. And so they have, uh, at the expense of the church, they have given scholarships out to needy families, and they are willing to invest in your children and tell them about Jesus and give them an education for eight hours a day. And so uh, my daughter asked me, uh, she said, what? What do you think I should do? We're, we're going we're gonna to act out a, um, a Bible story. And I said, well, let me tell you what my favorite one is. Started with that. My favorite story in all the Bible is the sinful woman that comes with the, with the, uh, the beautiful, expensive perfume, and she kneels at Jesus' feet, and she weeps over him, and she cleanses his feet, and she cries. And uh, I love that story for many reasons, but I love it because... She doesn't care that she was unwanted or unwelcomed in that environment. She knew that she had to push through some things to get to Jesus. And she knew that Jesus, although humanity would, would refuse her or turn her away, Jesus never would. And so, but that was a little intense for a third grader, right, Naya? That was a little too much. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to go to my second one. My second one is uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, many of us have heard the Vacation Bible School uh, version of this, which is fine, uh, because we all like to get to the punchline, but we never like to go to the process of what it takes to get to the victory. Um, Christians, we, we like to pray for uh, more faith, and God is saying, well, you didn't take the first step to begin with. And, and, and that's a step on toes, and that's a step on my own toes, but it's the reality. When's the last time you've said, Lord, put me in an uncomfortable situation to do something that is unthinkable so that you can receive glory? That's, that's not a prayer that we often even like or want, but I believe that the day is here to do it. I think that this, the, the season is set. The stage is certainly set, and the whole world is watching what is different about you Christians. Show us something different. We see panic. We see worry. We see concern. Uh, we see uh, reservation. We see indifference. What is different about this God that you say that you serve? And so one thing that I've looked at in Scripture this week over and over again is that, uh, you know, God doesn't like it when people say that he cannot do something, right? Right? Have you ever seen that? Um, and so uh, I was first studying Elijah in the contest of, uh, of Bell and God, and it wasn't much of a competition, it wasn't much of a contest, uh, but he steps onto the stage after his people beginning to worship someone else, and he says, I'm going to show you who I am so that you would believe and that you know that you in fact belong to me. God loves it when we pray prayers for the lost people that don't know him, people that are seeking for him, and those prayers are answered and answered in a big way. And so uh, as I was telling my daughter uh, about this story, and she knew parts of it, I said, let's get to the good part. But I didn't realize I was skipping over the main part. So I got to the good part, and, um, and, and I read this. Um, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he ruled and reigned over pretty much every territory at that point. Uh, God had allowed him uh, to take his Israelites captive. They were led to Babylon. And uh, 
this is where he made a mistake. And this is what it says. Uh, he says, I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of musical instruments. But if you refuse, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to save you from my power. I think that was the mistake. I think the mistake is a lot of us, we fixate on the question. And that question is being repeated over and over today in a lot of our minds. And maybe it's being asked to you indirectly or maybe directly. And they're saying, hey, do you really believe that your God can get you through this virus? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple question. Do you, in fact, believe that your God can get you through this virus? Do you believe that if you get this virus, that God can heal you? Do you believe that God can restore the job that you previously lost? Do you believe that God can heal this land? This is, this, is what, this is what he asked. He says, what God can rescue you from my power? And so this evening, um, the story gets really good with the reply. And so the reply was from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if you know the, the, uh, the context of this, these were three men, uh, probably young boys uh, at this point, and had probably been in captivity for a while. Uh, but they were snatched away from their families, from their territory, and uh, they were placed under the rule and reign of the Babylonians in Babylon. And, um, and, and they were in a unique position, but they had been in this position before. This wasn't the first time that death had shown up or the threat of death had shown up at their doorstep. So they were familiar with this. And this is their reply. It says, um, it says, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't even need to defend ourselves before you, but if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power. I, I want to stop right there because what he's about to say in a minute, it it's even more powerful than what he just said. But do you believe that God can rescue you? I, I've said it before in a different way, but, you know, that, that's the question. He goes on to say this. He says, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. I... Uh, I think that I think that sometimes if, if we're not careful, we put stipulations on our relationship with Jesus. I will serve you if you make sure that my family and friends are protected through this time. I will serve you if I get that promotion. I will serve you if you restore my marriage. I will restore you if you remove this hindrance from my life. And, and, and I think we've, we've missed the point because we've made something that is more than ourselves about ourselves. And God's saying, man, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a people, quite simply, that become selfless. I am looking for a group and a body of Christ that says, man, uh, whether you get the glory or not, it, it, it's going to be your job to give glory to the person that it is rightfully owned. And that's to the king. That's Jesus Christ. If he never does anything else for you, it doesn't mean that he's not worthy. He's already worthy of worship. And they said, oh, oh Nebuchadnezzar, we, we want to be really clear. Even if he doesn't, he's still worthy. That's, that's a powerful, powerful statement. And you don't make powerful statements and you, you don't have the faith when you're about to face a fiery furnace that's been heated up seven times without being close to a little heat before. And so the story actually starts in the selection of the menu. And so if you're familiar with the story, you understand that this isn't the first time that three men had stuck out. And today and age, to this day and age, right now, in this time of history, it's really easy to stick out. If, if you're doing anything uh, for the cause of Christ, the Father, His kingdom, uh, uh, obeying Him in any way, you, you are going to stick out. Smile because you are always on camera. 
And the opportunities that he is presenting yourselves are opportunities for your faith to grow to a place that maybe one day is coming and maybe has come, but you can't overstep the process. He's saying, I'm going to provide opportunities every day for you to serve me. Every single day, there's going to be things that I'm going to want you to do. And at one place, you will find yourself, man, perhaps with the faith of these men that say, I, 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 don't, I don't care what you do because our God can rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to retreat. We're not going to turn. We're going to trust. You don't get to that place without going through some things. The first time that we see them go through some things is, and they, they, they've been taken into captivity, and we know that it was several thousand people that were taken. They weren't alone. And the king wanted to serve them his menu of choice, steak and wine, or whatever they had. And Daniel was with them, and you know Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he says, he says we, can't, we can't eat that. Well, I, I researched that a little bit because I was a little confused because uh, he allowed them to change their names. Their names, in, in, in some contexts, uh, refer to uh, their god, the Chaldeans' gods, right? So he changed their birth names. He, he, he forced them to study astrology and, and other religions. They, they, went, they went along with that. But it came to the place where they would not compromise what the Word of God said because they would not eat meat or food that was offered to their gods, false gods. And they wouldn't eat things that hadn't been prepared in a certain way that broke God's law. They said, I will draw the line according to Scripture and we will not do that because I will obey God over that. And if you're a captive in a foreign land and they're asking you to eat something, the majority of, the, of us would probably eat it. But these guys said, no, 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 no. I'm feeling a warm flame, a warm sensation of the Holy Spirit. He is challenging me not to do it. They were uncertain of the outcome. There were no guarantees, even if he doesn't. And they said, I'll, I'll have nothing to do with that. Now, the thing about obedience is, God rewards it. Every time that you say yes to God for the right reasons to give him glory and to have this selfless act of saying, I just want you to be glorified, he rewards us. He rewards us for doing what we are already supposed to be doing. That's, a, that's an amazing thing because we, we don't deserve it. And I want, you to, I want you to see what happens if I can... If I can find this, right after his obedience was shown in the face of danger, in the face of threats, I'm sure. It says this in verse 17, chapter 1. God gave these four men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions of dreams. And you know how useful that's going to be uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the coming passages. But you understand that because they were obedient with a little, God gave them his, uh, his abilities in a, lot, in a lot of things. He says, you've shown me glory and you've honored me. And now I'm going to give you even more of the little bit that you showed. Now, it's interesting, and I'm going to read this scripture because um, I'm hoping that we find a little bit of an encouragement in the little things that we do. Because the little things that we do, they get us to a place where there may be a demand of a bigger event and a bigger thing. And so it, it, it says this, they're serving God, they're doing good, and once again their life is threatened because the king has a dream. And, and I don't think that's, that's the important part at this point. It's just knowing that through their obedience that their faith increased, but the obstacle and the opposition also increased. I can't be expected to go into war without first being trained up for the battle. I can't be expected to go out and proclaim the name of Jesus if I first haven't gotten closely into an encounter with Jesus. I'd be talking about somebody I didn't know. And he says, I, 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 need to, I need to get to know you before I throw you in the ring. And guess what? I'm going to go through it with you. And it says this. I, I want to show you. 
I want to show you the mindset of these people because um, it, it's, it's important that we the walk with faith. It's important that, that we have this understanding that God wants to use us every single day. It's important that if we're not living in the last days, which I don't know if we're, we are or not, ask somebody much smarter than me, you're living in your last days. I, I know that. I, I understand we, we all have a limited amount of time. So if you're looking at it from that context, hey, let's make the most of it. And so it says this. Th- this, is their, this is their mindset now. This is found in, uh, in verse number 20. Uh, they were all, their lives are threatened at this point. And Daniel went home and he, tur- and, and he told his friends this. He said he urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy. If, if that's not what we need for a day like today, I, I, I don't know what is. So I'll repeat those words in my own voice. Go gather your friends and ask God for his mercy to be poured out on our land. It's, it's that simple. Pray. If you've never prayed before, learn to pray. It's just like I'm doing now, but you're talking to somebody that can do something about it. Pray. Over and over again. He is a God that wants to show his children mercy, but we have to call upon him for it. And it says this. It says, he said, praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up their kings, their kingdoms. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things. He says he's the one that controls the course of world events. If, if there's uh, somebody out there and they're, they're feel fearful, they're concerned, they're worried. I mean, I, I don't know how you couldn't be. I, I go out there and I just think, you know, it's incredible what we've tried to build, build and have built, our forefathers built and what the principles we stand upon. It was really interesting how easily this kingdom began to collapse. I, I don't know if I'm the only one thought that. Every time I go out in public, I think, wow, we thought we had this all figured out and we had figured it out that we don't need God anymore and now we realize He was what was keeping us together. It's interesting. And as I think about that, do you believe that He is still in charge? Because I do. I believe that God saw this coming. I believe and I hope and I'm praying for His mercy that He will see us through. But I also believe that is if he doesn't, he's got a plan for those that believe. He's not going to forget about us. He hasn't forsaken us. His word says that he will not loosen his grip on it. He will not blot our names out of Lamb's book of life. These are promises. And the word of God says, my God keeps his promises. No matter what happens, we don't have to be fearful. No matter what happens, we don't have to dig ourselves in as they say this is the time for the church to pray for god's mercy if you'll turn to psalms 91 read a couple more scriptures and then i'm going to close because i believe that the word of god is true it says this those who live in the shelter of the most high will find rest in the shadow of the almighty this i declare about the lord he alone is my refuge my place of safety Who's your refuge and who is your place of safety? Where do you find it? It, it, It's important and it matters. It says, he is my God and I trust him for he will rescue me from every trap and protect me from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers, his shelter with your wings. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection i uh, i know that sometimes when you when you preach a message and and uh, i i understand that we're not all facing the same thing and so what i'm dealing with isn't perhaps what you're dealing with but my prayer tonight is and what i'm trying to communicate is is that every one of us we need to start feeling a little bit of the heat. 
if not stepping into it and praying God for the wisdom that when that opportunity comes, that we will be able to stand. I don't think any of us are going to be um, uh, standing before a ruler or, or uh, a king. Uh, I hope this doesn't happen. Uh, and they say, we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace. But I believe that there is the spirit of God that is living and dwelling in each one of us that has given us opportunities that saying, hey, listen, you may face a little bit of rejection. You may face a little bit of uncertainty. But get close to that flame. That Holy Spirit urging you to do something. Now's not the time to be quiet. Now's not the time to, to, to stay at home. I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, let's run the streets. Let's disobey authority. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying when decision time has to be made, trust in the Lord. To trust in the Lord. I'd like to, I'd like to close with this. Uh, I found this when I was researching um, the bubonic plague right? And I was trying to make comparisons of the, the Spanish flu, the bubonic plague, SARS and MERS, H1N1, all the different catastrophes that we had. And then I realized, you know what? As bad as the numbers and the death toll and all the things that took place, what we're facing right now is going to be more of a personal decision. It it, it doesn't matter that a third of the, the world was uh, consumed by certain diseases it matters that now is your opportunity to stand and rise up and to be the church. So it doesn't really matter what's happened in the, the past. We can't do anything about it. It matters what you choose to do today. And I, I want to read you an encourage, uh, just a, something that was encouraging to me. There was this guy, his name was Lord Craven. He was a Christian. He was a nobleman. Uh, he was living in London now, this was during the bubonic plague. They called it the, the Black Death. And uh, he was living in London. London was ravaged in the 15th uh, century. In, um, and so in order to escape the spreading pestilence, Lord Craven, uh, he was determined to leave the city for his country home, as many of his social standing did. Now, I want to I say this so, so we're really clear. There's a lot of people that have come from the city into uh into the lake area i i ain't talking about them okay we're talking about what we are doing when presented with a decision that will give god the glory and will allow us to be selfless right that's all i'm talking about word of god says to take up your cross and when he was talking about that he was talking to a group of people that understood that uh, uh that when somebody hung upon the cross it was because their life was no longer theirs the word of god also says that if you do not lose your life you will not gain your life selfless selflessness 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 it's, it's not popular. I, I get that. This isn't a popular message. That's fine. I, I don't care. This is what the Word of God says. It says this. It says, but as he was walking down the hall, he already had his coach and his baggage made ready. He was a man of uh, financial success. Not only that, this is the kind of man that has saved his money. He had honored God, and he was at in a position that not many people were other than in his social class. So that means in every right for everything that he has done, he had every right to leave the city and go to his country home and to be safe, secure, and comfortable. He had every right to do that. But it's important what he, he noticed. He noticed someone that didn't quite have the same positioning. Are we noticing people that don't have our positioning and it says this, as he's walking down one of the halls of his home, about to enter into his carriage, he overheard one of his servants say to another, I suppose by my Lord's quitting London to avoid the plague that his God lives in the country and not in the town. It was straightforward and it was apparently innocent remark, but it struck Lord Craven so deeply that he canceled his journey saying this, my God lives everywhere and can preserve me in town as well as in the country. I will stay where I am. So he stayed in London. He helped the plague victims and he did not catch the disease. 
I was, I was blown away with that when I read it. Every time I'm, I'm blown away with that. You want to know why I'm blown away with that? Because the world is looking, they're looking for a whole lot more like Jesus and a whole lot more than us. Amen? And so what I'm seeing, I'm seeing a man that didn't have to do what he did. And that to me looks like a whole lot like God who sent his son that he didn't have to send for someone who could not repay it and could not earn it and who needed it. He saw his servants and he saw his people uh, in, in his home. And he says, you know what, I can leave and I'll be safe. But what about these guys? It looks a whole lot like Jesus did when he was in the Mount, when he was in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, and over and over he said these things. He said, "Lord, I, if there's any way to escape this, that's what I want. But let it be Your will be done." He made a decision, and he felt the flame. Three different times he called out to God for the cup of suffering to be taken away, the cup of suffering to be taken away from him. But yet each time he chose to drink from it. So tonight, we are presented with a very, very unique opportunity. And I want to know if you're, if you're prepared. Because the only way that the church goes forward in a time like this is when men and women are willing to put their self and their priorities to the side and say, Man, I've, I've done it this way. I've consumed this life by myself. I know where that gets me. I think I'm going to try your way. I, I believe that I'm going to put my selfish desires to the side, and I think I want to look to my left and right and see if my brother or sister is in need because this is where I'm going to stay because where I am is where God wants me to be. I'm not going to run. I'm not going to flee. I believe that he can protect me here. I believe that my God can rescue me. I believe that I still serve a God who has everything in order. I still serve a God that wants to, he wants to rescue his people. Amen. So I'm going to close with a word of prayer, and then I am uh, I'm going to let you get back to doing what you're doing. Lord Jesus, Father, I thank you for your words. Lord, and I am asking for a group of people in this area and other areas that have stumbled across this, Lord Jesus, that they would get down on their knees and they say, God, show us and give us your mercy. Heal our land. Father, I'm asking for the town of Eldon and Barnett and Versailles to be healed by your goodness, Father. And I am asking that the, oper- that the avenue that you choose to use is your love. Local churches, Father, you have placed them strategically in in positioning for times like this. That said, I want you to help this person, and I want you to help this group of people. Church, it's time to wake up. Lord Jesus, we're asking for your mercy to be shown upon us. Father, we believe that as we stand before you, that we serve a God who will rescue us from these current events. Why? Father, because you are still in charge. We praise you, and we thank you for tonight, Father. And we're asking for opportunities for the church to go forward. In the name of Jesus, you've been so, so good to us. Amen.